Hi, Mark again, and we are going in this segment to discuss creation. And I'm excited about this because this really illustrates the power and sovereignty of, of our God. And if you're finding that these um, studies are helpful, and you know other people who are hungry for meat, then um, please please pass the word on. Thank you. All righty. I'm going to um, begin by reading just a few verses from Genesis. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good. And God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day. And the darkness he called night. And there was evening. And there was morning. The first day. Now we're talking about Genesis um, chapter 1, and we're going to be dealing with the creation of the universe, not really discussing um, mankind per se, just in passing. Um, we'll get to the creation of uh, humanity in the, in the next segment, but this is going to be primarily the creation of the, of the universe. And... Um, that's what I want to focus on. I want to say a couple of things uh, by way of introduction. Um, Genesis 1 through 11 should be seen as history, uh, space-time history. Um, no different from chapter 12 onwards. It, these, what is recorded here is, is, is history. And... Another th uh, issue that people deal with is the supposed contradictory accounts between Genesis 1 and Genesis 2. And they're not contradictory, they are complementary. What happens in Genesis 1 is that there is a focus on the macro picture. God systematically um, cre well, creating everything and making it... Um, increasingly habitable for mankind and then he shifts the focus or perspective in chapter 2 to a more narrow focus and that's on uh, the pinnacle of his creation and that's mankind um, so there is not contradictory there it's uh, beautifully uh, woven together in a complementary way I want also to read from Revelation where it says, Worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. God creating the world is everywhere in the Bible, implicitly if not explicitly. So there's no need to um, pile up verse after verse after verse. It's really all throughout the Bible. Um, but the text in, in Revelation 4.11 that I just um, read to you shows the astonishing unity of God's inspired word, as well as the goal of not only theology, but in general, but in particular, that of creation. And that is the goal is doxology or the praise and worship of our omnipotent creator and redeemer. That's is but that's what the goal of this of creation is, and the goal of this study on creation is to fill our hearts with worship for God. Now let's uh, attempt a definition of creation, okay? I would define creation, borrowing from Burkhoff as that free act of God whereby he, according to his sovereign will and for his own glory, 
in the beginning brought forth the whole visible and in, and invisible universe without the use of pre-existing material and thus gave it an existence distinct from his own and yet always dependent on him. So one of the most Profound, important verses in the Bible is Genesis 1 1. Bereshi, bara Elohim, Shamayam, Waha Aratz. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. What we have in that first verse is not just a thematic statement, it is, in fact, the first act of creation. Out of nothing, God creates the basic universe as well as something to put it in, space and time. And he calls it heaven and earth. And the subsequent verses after that in chapter 1 build upon verse 1 as we see God systematically making God, excuse me, making the earth increasingly habitable for mankind to live uh, in. First thing I want to say is that creation um, leads to worship. As I had mentioned, God created the world as Lord, and it ought to elicit from us praise and worship, as we noted in Revelation 4.11. 4, creation motivates the heavenly hymnody. Two, it was against the pagan poly polytheistic views of creation that Moses, in part, was um, wrote this. Now, he was also teaching us, obviously, the truth. But Moses was brought up as a child in which he was taught all these pagan myths. And so, we, in trying to understand um, the original audience and how they would have viewed Genesis 1, uh, it would have the intention would have been to correct any of the pagan myths that were trying to come in and influence the uh, Jews at that time, and at least you know blending or causing syncretism. I'm sure that Adam and Eve had the same knowledge of how God created and it was passed down to their children and eventually became um, this knowledge became corrupted and formed the pagan myths that we know today in which we see some similarities with the truth but the, dis the dissimilarities are greater um, than the similarities. This was revealed to Moses by God himself or he could not have written with such clarity and specificity about um, this creation account. The notions of multiple authorship of Genesis and um, is really pseudo scholarship. I remember when I was in college and I took Old Testament and I was taught, the, I think it was called the Veilhausen theory. It was, uh, I saw it destroy the faiths of a lot of young people. And as Kuiper put it, it's nothing less than biblical evangelism. Um, there, we have every reason, good reason, to believe that Moses wrote um, Genesis and the rest of the Pentateuch. Except for it talks about his death, and that's where Joshua comes in. Third point, the, crea the creation um, points out God's lordship. I've mentioned on another occasion that the one way of summarizing worldviews is to say that there's really only two worldviews, um, oneism and twoism. Uh, and nothing brings this out more clearly than creation. Oneism is a pagan worldview or any non-Christian worldview in which all is one. 
and the creator creature distinction is denied. So again, um, within oneism, the false worldview, all reality basically is one. But in this creation account, we see the true worldview, and at the heart of any worldview is, is what is ultimate reality, what is the nature of God. And we see that at the heart of the creation account is this distinction between the creator and the creation. I mean, that's the heart and soul of Genesis 1 and 2, is this creator, the transcendence of the creator over his creation and the distinction between uh, him and his creation. So in the Bible, there's two kinds of reality, God and everything else. So it's either one or two, oneism or twoism. Now, do you remember um, in the beginning of this series on systematic theology, I talked about the lordship attributes, and they there were three of them. There was power or, or sovereignty, authority, and presence. Those are the three lordship attributes. And we can see them clearly, very clearly, in this uh, creation of the universe. We see, first of all, God's sovereign control. Obviously, as he speaks creation into uh, existence by his omnipotent word, Psalm 24, 1 through in 2 reminds us that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. God owns all things and is Lord over all and has a right to do as he wishes. He rules and the universality of his kingship rule is seen in the verbiage of verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, meaning everything. So God is a sovereign ruler. And as it says in Nehemiah 9.6, You are the Lord, you alone. You have made heaven, the heaven of heavens, with all their hosts, the earth and all that's on it, the seas and all that's in them. And you preserve all of them, and the hosts of heaven worship you. That's beautiful. Nehemiah 9.6 we also see God's authority. Creation is by his word. Like a commander issuing commands to his army, um, things obey God, even things that don't exist. Things that don't even exist before they even exist, obey him, except they exist in the mind of God. That is, God is creating things out of nothing. And uh, that, my friends, is authority. As things are recognizing the voice of their creator. Over and over and over again, God speaks and things hop and pop. He interprets his creation and that's an expression of authority because naming, particularly in antiquity, was an expression of authority, which was then passed on to Adam, as you may recall. He uh, named the animals, and that was indicative of his role, authoritative, authoritative role. And now, for example, um, think of astrology, okay, and how common. Even amongst Christians, astrology is today. It's in you know, virtually every newspaper. Uh, it's probably in many people's uh, email uh, boxes on a daily basis. Now, listen to these verses, because part of God's authority is his authority to evaluate and interpret his creation. Okay? So, in in verse 14 and following, it says, And God said, Let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night, 
and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. And let them be lights in the expanse of the heavens to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And God made the two great lights, the great light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night, sun and the moon, and the stars. And God set them in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth, to rule over the day and over the night, and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw it was good. So over against astrology, which, again, Moses would have known about well, because um, they would have been in the uh, court. God gives the true interpretation of the nature and function of these various lights, the sun, the planets, and the stars. You know, why look to the creation instead when, when we can look to the creator for guidance or wisdom? Not to mention the fact that looking to, to them for wisdom and for guidance is contrary to their created design. God tells us, he has the authority to tell us, evaluate and interpret what the purpose of the sun, the moon, the constellations are, and it's not to give us wisdom. That is a form of idolatry. You know, looking to his creation instead of to the creator for guidance. Okay, and then the third component of God's lordship is his presence. And I'll be shorter with that. We see God's presence as Lord in verse 2, where the Holy Spirit is hovering over the waters. And what happens is that after God created just the general um, space-time continuum and... Um, earth in general it was it was not yet habitable and it was chaos not in a a, um, a greek sort of way but it needed to be ordered and um, the holy spirit um, god's presence was was there and there's a sense of anticipation of what god was going to do and then you have of course Another expression of God's presence was every time he spoke, that is his presence. Number three, notice the um, in Scripture the connection, close connection between the um, creation and salvation. You know, it says in Jonah 2.9 that salvation is of the Lord. God is absolutely sovereign and salvation just as he is absolutely sovereign was absolutely sovereign in um, in in creation you know with moses as the same author of genesis as exodus you know we can expect to see parallels between the creation of the world and the liberation from egypt and uh, we do because we see god uh, bring to bear all the forces of nature, which he created in Genesis 1. He, he brings all of them to bear to show his supremacy um, to Pharaoh and over Pharaoh and the false gods. So scripture often in the Old and New Testament speaks of salvation in terms of creation or recreation. And there's a particularly lovely verse in 2 Corinthians, quoting from Genesis 1-3. Um, let me, actually I want to start a couple of verses before that so you can see the context. Paul says, if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world, Satan, has blinded the minds of unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For what we, we for what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, with ourselves as your servants, for Jesus' sake. And here it comes. For God, who said, and this is quoting from uh, Genesis 1-3, 
let light shine out of the darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 4, 4 through 6. So the same power, the same God who created the universe, that same, it takes that same power that created the universe to save a person. That's how lost we are with sin, Satan, and um, the world all being our sl uh, slave masters. And then Second Corinthians 5.17 uses the language where it says, If anyone is in Christ, they are a new, what? creation. Number four, there is the um, truth that um, creation is out of nothing. And this is called creation ex nihilo. And uh, Hebrews 11.3 says, By faith we understand that the universe was created by the word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. Um, creation. God created out of nothing. Now, <laughs> think about that. Try to conceive nothing. That's, that's difficult to define and it's difficult to conceptualize. What is, what is nothing? Well, I don't know if I, I can define it, but what the doctrine and truth of God creating out of nothing, ex nihilo, does is that it corrects two false views. The first one being that the idea that God created from pre-existing eternal mat material, and that was a very common notion um, back in, um, in, in ancient times, and in some sense, uh, a lot of people still hold to that. And then the second false view that this corrects is what is known as Gnostic emanation from divine essence. And that's the idea, it's kind of like the rays of the sun coming down. And um, the, the idea is that you have this impersonal divine power and there's layers and layers of emanations from it and the further you get away from uh, the original, the fainter it gets. But basically, the the Earth is is one manifestation or emanation from this divine essence, and creation itself then is divine. It basically is pantheism. Um, so, and th that is a, a common belief today and is kind of really at the heart of um, paganism. It may not be stated exactly in those words as far as emanation, but um, I mean, oftentimes it is. Now we come to a real hot button issue and that's the question of the six days. And what do we make of that creation in six days well i believe it was six literal days it's the most natural view um, it's the most natural rendering of the hebrew word yom for day i base my belief um, not on a scientific basis, because I'm not a scientist, but on an exegetical basis. My understanding of the genre, uh, the Hebrew language, and without going into all the technicalities, uh, it is definitely most in line with 
the with the language of both the Hebrew and the English Bible. If you were just to read it and take it as it as it stated, the most natural reading is that it's it's six literal days. And as the second reason is that this creation is based on a seven day work week. Um, and that the Sabbath, the seventh day, um, is is based on, on on the notion of a, a six day work week and a six day creation where God worked and uh, then we work and then there's a day of rest. Then you have the recurring refrain where it says after each day. Um, and there is evening and, and, and morning, uh, a first day, evening, morning, a second day, and so on. And uh, I would defer to you to the Creation Research Society who's done a lot more um, study on this than I have. And um, might answer some of the questions that, that you would have. But I... I've studied this. Don't have time to go into all all the questions, but you might have. But I'll try to touch on a few. I'll just say that there are good reasons to believe that the Bible itself affirms that it was six literal days. And as far as like the age of the Earth, um, you know, what about the light of the stars? You know, isn't that, wouldn't that have taken billions of years to get to us? Well, we're told in Genesis 131 that, behold, um, God again showing his authority, evaluating his His uh, creation. He said, behold, it was very good. So, since this was a uh, special creation, a miraculous creation, you can expect there to be some singular events occurring. And if God's going to, in a systematic way, make his his earth habitable for mankind, then he's going to make everything set so that it's in its proper order. Point being is that the light of the stars could have already been created. They could have already been have reached us in, in a way. And that in no way implies deception. It implies perfection on God's part as far as his planning and the stars aren't being up there without us being Adam being able to see them. Um, they were put there to be seen and to be um, wondered at and to worship God um, at the, because of their beauty and to enjoy them. So the order, <coughs> the order and the habitability is, is part of creation being very good. Then we see in Luke's genealogy of Jesus, it goes all the way back to Adam. And we know that he skips a, a few um, because sometimes there's um, the... Um, genealogies aren't strict chrono chronologies so we can we, we, we could expect a, a few um, uh, omissions but tossing in a few million years is just unthinkable is preposterous and um, we're talking about thousands of years um, given what scripture says about itself and that that could sound laughable to you but it only it's only laughable because of how much Satan has plunged our the whole world into the darkness of evolution so let's see here when God made Adam, 
suppose he was 30 years old, okay? Three, three seconds after creation. Now, I know, and I would insist, that, that Adam was a special creation of God. And let's say that three seconds after creation, he looked 30 years old. He didn't look like a baby. Um, he had to have the appearance of more age than he was. At three seconds old, and he had the appearance of 30 years old, he had the appearance of more age than he actually was, and there's no deception there. It's just part of God's good plan to have a man who could love a woman right away. Which is what his intention was. Similarly, all the trees in the garden, um, which God would have made for Adam to have enjoyed, would have already been in a grown, grown state, giving the appearance of age. It's not deception. It's planning is wisdom and another thing is that the minerals in the ground would have had to have been in proper balance for it to be habitable which was the whole process of of this first chapter it was a systematic um, making of the earth habitable for mankind and the uh, proper disbursement of decaying plants or organic matter to, in order to, for plants to grow would again give the appearance of, of age. Um, I helped my son and my daughter-in-law just today dig and plant flowers and there already were minerals uh, in the ground because of how old, how long it had already been there, decayed organic materials, the leaves and so forth um, that over time. But for the garden, since it was um, immediately and specially created by God and was very good, that is perfect from the beginning, it had to have the appearance of age. And there's no deception. That's a, that's a false charge, people saying that's a deception. You know, according to the rules of the uniformity of calls we use in science today, that wouldn't be applicable to a situation where God is creating things ex nihilo, and the dating systems wouldn't be applicable as well. You know, some have said that this, again, that this is deception on God's part, but not so. The general scientific principles cannot be applied to things which are made miraculously, particularly at the beginning. And listen to this, please. Anyone who admits to special creation at all must agree in general of the reality of apparent age. I'll say that again. Anyone who admits to special creation at all must agree in principle with the reality of apparent age. Think about that. Okay, fifthly, how about the issue of evolution? I reject it. <laughs> yeah, I can guess it already. For a number of reasons. Genesis 2 7. Jesus clearly talks about Adam being a real man. And if he wasn't, then Jesus was lying. And if Jesus lied, then he was a sinner. Because Jesus is a rabbi. If you don't tell the truth as a rabbi, a rabbi then you're li uh, that's a sin. Now, to mention the fact that Jesus is compared to Adam as um being the second adam uh the second man the sec and the final adam so if we deny the historicity of the first adam then, then we uh mess up the whole pair uh parallel between um the imputations his uh, his sin imputed to us um and then the imputation of our sin from Adam to Christ on the cross and his righteousness being imputed to us. 
Uh, another reason I reject evolution is uh, it says in in, um, in scripture it says that things were created according to their kind, and this contradicts the theory of macro evolution in which there is cross kind change on a, a huge scale. Um, thirdly, there's nobody, I think, in their right mind would deny micro evolution. We see small changes uh, in uh, adaptability and all kinds of things. But macro evolution, no. And I would uh, recommend Lee Strobel's book, The Case for Creation, The Case for, Case for the Creator. There's an impressive array of data from various disciplines and, and scholars um, showing the hopeless problems with life deriving from a single cell. It's just a, um, a notion that is intellectually bankrupt and uh, preposterous, really. And I agree with Philip Johnson, who said that the real persuasive power of the theory of evolution is not based on evidence, but rather on its being the only viable naturalistic alternative to theism or creation by God. That's why people get so viscerally connected to it and so hot and bothered uh, as far as defending it because the only alternative is acknowledging what people in our naturally sinful state hate and that is that we have a sovereign God who created us before whom we owe uh, absolute um, obligation. So this theory has done incalculable harm in countless areas and in countless ways. And um, it appeals to the spiritual and anti-God tendencies in folks. But I would say that um, this guy that I mentioned, Phil Johnson, we all should thank God for him because he really got the ball rolling and there's a lot of folks who are in the intelligent design field now but um, he's one who really did the pioneering work and um, so there's other evidence against evolution but as I said check out um, Strobel's book the great thing about it is that You'd have to buy seven or eight books from these, from everything from microbiology to astronomy and so forth to get uh, the evidence that you can get in just one volume uh, from his. And I would just close with this, that um, this is a huge subject just by its very nature. But I praise God for his, even though creation has now fallen, it's still lovely, and it should still cause us to praise God. And I hope and pray that you enjoy His beautiful creation. Um, let's pray. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we know that it was a Trinitarian plan from all eternity and a Trinitarian execution of your plan to create and we thank you for the beauty of your creation even in its fallenness there is still just the magic wonderment of how lovely it is the unity amongst the, amidst the diversity the astonishing diversity that we find in the kinds of critters and plants and just how beautiful your world is. So we thank you that 
you created your universe. I know we spoke about the visible universe, but we also thank you for the invisible part of it as well. We pray this in the name of Christ, our Creator and our Redeemer. Amen.